The second oldest roller coaster in the world is this, the Great Scenic Railway at Luna Park in Melbourne, Australia. It was built in 1912 and it's one of very few roller coasters in the world where the brakes are still operated manually. Where a brake operator, like Freya there, rides along on every run, timing everything and making sure that the riders go over the hills at exactly the right speed every time. So obviously, I had some questions for Freya and the team here about how it all works, but I thought I might want to wait until Freya was a little bit less busy. <laughs> I have been driving for about five or six years now, um, which is a lot of fun, um, sending people around on a roller coaster. Um, it's pretty an pretty unusual job. We usually try and keep people on only for like an hour at a time, because um, it can get very tiring, obviously. it's all manual labor, slowing it down. We do about 24 hours worth of training, which includes doing a walk of the track, theory, as well as a lot and a lot and a lot of driving. Same as driving a car, trying to expose them to as many different conditions as possible. I did not expect to get actual airtime for a 110 year old roller coaster. Wow, that's not a bad view from up here either. <laughs> it is so dependent on the conditions that you're driving on. There's no this is exactly how you drive the train every time. Everyone has their own little ways of doing it. We obviously don't just throw someone behind the brake and say, go for it, because standing up on a roller coaster is a weird thing to do. Once they're all comfortable standing up, we'll move them behind the brake. And as the trainer, you will tell them when to apply and not apply brake. And from then on, it's just doing a lot of laps to get experience in different conditions. Every cycle you run is different. You've got to be able to make those judgment calls. If it is too windy, depending on the direction it's coming from, it will stop the train. So we keep an eye out on like the wind radar and things like that to keep a, a ballpark as well as our drivers have a pretty good idea of how that's impacting the train. Rain we also don't run in. It makes the train go way too fast and it becomes difficult to actually slow it down. If it does come to a stop, if it's too windy or something like that, we get a team of people to come up, they walk up the track, which are all trained how to do, and then give it a big push start to get it going, which is always a bit of fun and entertainment for all of the guests on board. Sure, this is more than 100 years old, but it needs to perform to 21st century safety standards and get 21st century inspections. So how does it do that? Where we run into modern safety rules, we have to negotiate with the Heritage Council and say this is the most sensitive way we can possibly achieve the result. It's a difficult balance again. It's a very, very expensive one to, to maintain. Continuous maintenance, and by no means is it off the shelf. It, it's all I need, hundreds of equipment. We have to replace like for like wherever possible. That means we have to have them manufactured specially. It's a never-ending job. <laughs> so we only run two trains on the track. The first train that is dispatched is required to get halfway around the track before we dispatch the next one. Now there are four blocks defined on the track by lights. Two opportunities on every circuit to pull the train up that was done nigh on 20 years ago. Modern legislation, we had to conceive of everything that could possibly go wrong. The longer you leave risk, the more chance has got of occurring. And there have been discussions to modernise that control system so that the brakes on the train could be invoked externally. All of these things are on the list and will eventually have to happen. No question.